Hi everyone, my name is uh, Shazia Khan and today's session is on contract law uh, unit 3.2a and the learning outcome today that we'll be doing is to understand contractual terms and exclusion clauses. The last learning outcome, which is learning outcome two that we did, we looked at understanding the key elements of a binding contract. We looked at offer, acceptance, consideration, acceptance, and we looked at case law in regards to this. We also looked at um, the elements of a binding contract, which we looked at consideration. Uh, as I mentioned, um, consideration must be legal, consideration must be requested with reference to cases. And uh, now we'll be looking at the contractual terms and exclusion clauses. So the uh, learning outcomes are to analyze the difference between a condition and a warranty, use a case, cases to exemplify the analysis and explain how terms are implied within contracts. We'll also be looking at explaining the importance and methods of incorporation and also assessing the importance of construction for interpretation of the contract. So uh, 3.1, we will be looking at analysing the difference between a condition and a warranty uses ca using cases to exemplify the analysis. Firstly, though, we need to look at what the contract terms, uh, what contract terms are before we can go on to the, um, the difference between the condition and warranty. So a contract term is any provision or term that forms part of a contract. Each of these terms provides a contractual obligation which can lead to litigation if breached. So it's really important that every contract that a business or an organisation enters into will have critical terms that fall into various categories and that they are abided by. The terms of agreement can bind parties by law to meet a set of minimum obligations, which is why the groups involved will commonly go back and forth to uh, during negotiations on clauses and terms that both the parties are satisfied with. The terms of a contract are there to protect the parties by best interest by establishing deadlines, fees, compensations. Some terms, as we're going to go through, are standard terms and are used in many different types of contract, but others are exclusively specific to the parties involved. So firstly, we'll go on to what a condition is. So a condition is a term of a contract that goes to the root of the contract. In a sale of goods contract, this might include a clause that states that the time that time is of essence. For example, it is a condition of a contract that goods must be delivered by a specific time. If a condition is breached and aggrieved, a party has the right to treat uh, the breach of uh, as repudiatory, which means that the aggrieved party can um, either um, terminate the contract or treat the contract as continuing, affirm the contract. In either cases, the aggrieved party can claim damages. It's important to note that a breach of a condition entitles the aggrieved party to terminate regardless of the nature or consequences of the breach, even if the aggrieved party has suffered little loss as a result of the breach. And this was identified in a quite an important case, which is uh, the case of Poussard um, and Spears and Pond, 1876. And this was a good example of a case where a breach of a condition took place. So in this case, an actress was hired to sing in the opera, but got ill and could not perform until a couple of weeks after the premiere. It was held by the courts that this breach went to the root of the contract and therefore the opera could repudiate the contract and hire a new actress. On the other hand, there was another case which was to do with conditions, which was uh, the case of, of Bettany and Guy, 1876. Um, and this is an example where the breach of co contract did not go to the root of the contract and was therefore uh, not considered as a breach of condition. In this case, the singer was hired to sing and perform for a month, which included six days of rehearsals. The singer missed out a few days of her rehearsals but this were not held as breach of condition and damages were the only remedy available in this instance. The, two, the outcome of the two cases tells us that a breach of an obligation in a contract have to be significant in order to call it a breach of a condition. 
the next one we're going to look at is warranty. So a warranty is a term of the contract, which is less significant than a condition, and which usually is written as an assurance or a promise. For example, in a services contract, there might be a requirement to have staff trained at a specific level. If breached, it would deprive the aggrieved party of the whole of the benefit of the contract. A term that is a warranty in one contract might be a condition in another, depending on how important that term is to the parties. Statements about factual matters are commonly expressed as warranties in a contract. For example, a party might warrant that it, was obt it has obtained all required consents at the start of the contract. Such a statement is likely to be accepted as a warranty. So, like we said, a warranty is considered an ancillary to the main terms of the contract. So, a breach of a warranty would only amount to damages, and the innocent party does not have the right to repudiate the contract. And an example of this is the case of Wills and Amber 1954, where a four-birth motorboat had been sold. An innocent statement by the seller that the hull was sound was held to be a warranty, which the buyer had entered into the contract in reliance upon it, when in fact the hull was rotten, but in the contract was not substantially different to that which the parties originally intended. He was awarded damages in this. Another case in regards to a warranty was the case of um, Schuler AG and Wickman Machine Tool Sales Limited, 1974. Um, in this case, the House of Lords stated that a breach of a condition allows for termination of the contract. But the case also shows that even if the parties themselves expressly designated a particular obligation as a contract, as a condition, the word condition is not always conclusive. The circumstances surrounding uh, the agreement may indicate the parties had no intention of using the word in its technical sense. Additionally, the law itself made an indication of the status of the particular term. It may be implied either by statute, for example, the Sale of Goods Act 1979, or by a previous judicial decision. So comparison chart, the meaning of a condition requirement or even that should be performed before the completion of another action is known as a condition. Warranty, on the other hand, is an assurance given by the seller to the buyer about the state of the product that prescribed facts are genuine. What is the result? It is directly associated with the objective of the contract. It is subsidiary provision relating to the object of the contract. The results that can be identified for a condition is termination of a contract and for a warranty, you can claim damages as stated earlier. The violation for a condition is violation of a condition can, can be regarded as a violation of the warranty. A violation of a warranty is a violation of warranty does not affect the condition. Remedies available to the aggrieved party on the breach. So for a condition, it'd be to repudiate the contract as well as claim damages. And for a warranty, the only thing you can do is claim damages. So 3.2, explain how terms are implied within a contract. So express term, express terms and implied terms. When you we asked to sign a contract on behalf of your business, you think it should be reasonable to assume that the contract contains all the commercial terms. However, contracts can contain both express and implied terms. Um, an express term is the terms which parties explicitly include in a contract and are known as express term. Um, if the intentions of the parties are not clear from the express terms, it may be necessary to imply terms into the contract. A contract rarely stands alone in absolute isolation. It may arise out of a particular cause of dealing between the parties. It may relate to a particular set of circumstances, or it may be in relation to a type of transaction which always has certain rules attached to it. In any of these situations, the contract might not expressively include all of the terms that relate to it. Therefore, it may be necessary to incorporate implied terms. Express terms is usually in writing, but it can be verbal if the contract itself is verbal.
contract uh, for implied terms by statute. So traditionally, legal statutes had little impact on a contract freely entered into. However, increasingly terms are implied by statute, which may be precedence to the express terms of the contract. For example, uh, a landlord and tenant may agree that by the way of a deposit, the tenant will give the landlord a, pa a painting. Uh, the tenancy may include an express term stating this. However, according to the Housing Act 2004, in a deposit in relation to the short hold, um, residential tenancy must be in monetary form. This law may override the express term in the contract. A common type of contract which is likely to contain terms implied by statute is a contract for the sale of goods. Under common law, the principle of cave em toro or let the buyer beware applied to most contracts for the sale of goods. This means that is up to the buyer to make sure he knew he, what he was buying. And um, there is a case in example in regards to this, which is the Le Liverpool City Council and Irwin case 1977. Uh, in this case, Liverpool City Council owned a block of flats in which the defendant was a tenant. The common parts of the flats, the lifts, staircases, rubbishes, chutes, had fallen into disrepair. A rent strike was implemented by many of the tenants, including the defendant. The council sought to evict the defendant for non-payment of rent, and she counterclaimed for breach of an obligation to repair. However, the tenancy agreement did not mention um, any obligation to repair. In fact, the tenancy agreement only impose obligations on the tenant with no mention of the obligations of the landlord. The defendant asked the court to imply a term that the council had an obligation to repair the common parts of the block of flats. It was held in this case that the courts did imply a term. The implied term arose as a legal incident in contracts of a defined type between landlord and the tenant that the landlord was to take reasonable care to maintain the common parts. However, there was no breach of his duty. Today, various terms are implied into most contracts for the sale of goods. Some of the most important terms are the seller has good title to the goods. For example, he actually owns them. The goods correspond to the description given by the seller. Uh, the goods will be reasonably fit for the purpose for which they are sold and of satisfactory quality. And where a large quantity of goods is purchased following production of a sample, all of the goods will be the same quality as the sample. Whether or not the parties can include a valid express term, in excluding the terms which would otherwise be implied by statute, may depend on the number of factors. These could include the previous business relationship between the parties, the relative bargaining power of the parties in the particular term, which it sought to include. The so contract uh, terms implied by custom. Some contracts may be entered into the context of widely accepted business practices common to all the contracts of that type. Therefore, even if the contract does not include an express term that the practice applies, it may be implied that it does. If the parties decide that the practice or custom will not apply, they, they may have to include an express term excluding it. If the parties have excluded an express term excluding the usual practice, this should usually take precedence to the general custom which applies to that sort of contract. So an example here would be, for example, when contracting a plumber, there might be an implied term that they will bring their own tools as this is standard practice in industry. And uh, to imply a term into a contract by way of a custom, uh, you must be able to show the custom or usage exists. You need to prove that the term is so notorious that everyone in the trade reasonably assumes that it will be part of the agreement. It also cannot contradict any express terms between the parties. A case in regards to this was the case of Hutton and Warren, 1836. In this case, the claimant was a farmer who had tenancy on the defendant's fields. The claimant had planted corn 
and barley on the fields and worked in the fields to ensure the crops would grow before the field was due to be harvested, harvested the tenancy was terminated the claimant then submitted a bill to the defendant for the work and cost of seed spent on the field as was customary in the farming tenancies the defendant refused to pay stating that there was nothing in the tenancy agreement stating that such compensation was payable it was held by the court that uh, an implied uh, the court implied a term into the tenancy providing for compensation for the work and expenses undertaken in growing the crops. The term was implied as it was common practice for farming tenancies to contain such a clause. The courts may imply terms into a contract to give effect to the intentions of the contracting parties. Generally, a court will only imply a term into a contract where it is obvious that it represents what all the parties intended when they entered into the agreement and where the term is necessary to give business efficiency to their contract. The courts may also imply a term into the contract if it is necessary to do so for the count contract to comply with common law. However, for many contracts, the necessary term may already have been implied into the agreement because it's containing legal statute. So it's really important for the courts to take into uh, mind that they need to apply certain terms that apply to the parties involved to, that want to uh, perform the contract. 3.3, we're going to look at now explaining the importance of methods of incorporation. Incorporation of terms in English law is the inclusion of terms in contracts formed under English law in a way that the courts recognise them as valid. For a term to be considered incorporated, it must fulfil three requirements. Firstly, notice of the terms should be given before or during the agreement of the contract. Secondly, the terms must be found in the document intended to be contractual. And thirdly, reasonable steps must be taken by the party who forms the term to bring it to the attention of the other party. And the rules on incorporated terms in English law are almost at, all at common law level. So, just uh, just reiterating what we're talking about in the incorporation of terms. Once a statement has been identified as a term of a contract, it's not the case that this will always be binding on the parties. The term must have been successfully incorporated into the contract, so it must have formed the contract. And these are the three requirements. So the firstly, first one we're going to look at is um, the notice. So notice for a term to be considered incorporated into contract, notice of the term must be giving, given before or during the time of the contract. And the leading case for this is the, the case of um, Ollie and uh, Marlborough Court Limited, 1949. The facts of this case is that Ollie was a guest in the defendant's hotel. On arrival, Ollie paid for a week's board in advance and then went to the room. In the room, a notice was displayed saying the properties would not be re responsible for any items lost or stolen unless handed to them for safekeeping. Ollie left the room and deposited her key on the board in reception before leaving the hotel. The key was taken and several items were stolen from her room. Ollie sought damages in negligence. The court held that Ollie was successful in her claim and recovered the cost of her stolen items in their entity. The exclusion clause had not been successfully incorporated into the contract because the contract was concluded at reception and the notice perpetrating to exclude liability was not visible until after the contract was formed when the guest entered the room. An exception to the rule on notice is past dealings. If the parties uh, have th had similar dealings in the past, the courts have previously found that notice is not necessarily required if their past dealings represent a consistent cause of action, as we just mentioned in the case of Ollie and Marlborough Court, Hotel 1949. Contractual document. The second rule required for clauses to be considered 
um, incorporated is that they must be found in a document intended to be contractually uh, binding. And the leading case for this is the case of uh, Chapelton and Barry Urban District Council 1940. And in this case, the pa party A hired deck chairs from party B. The ticket he was given contained a term um, exempting the council for um, liability for any injury in relation to hiring of those chairs. It was held that the term was not incorporated into the contract as a ticket was a receipt and not a contractual uh, document. Uh, if one signs a contractual document, it is automatically considered to be binding even if the party has not read the terms and that's the important case in regards to this was the case of Leon Strage and Grogob 1934 and the facts in this case is the claimant Le Strage contracted to purchase a slot machine for cigarettes from the defendant Grogob and the agreement included an express clause stating that this agreement contains all the terms and conditions under which I agree to purchase the machine specified above and any express or implied condition statement or warranty statutory or otherwise not stated herein is hereby uh, excluded. The machine proved to be faulty and the claimant thus brought an action against the defendant alleging that the machine breached the Sale of Goods Act by not being of uh, merchantable quality. The defendant asserted that the statute was made irrelevant by the express clause and that it was not in breach of the agreement they had made. The claimant responded she had been unaware of the clause as she had not properly read the agreement and it ought not apply. The Court of Appeal in this case held and found that the defendant determined, determining that the express provisions of the contract were binding and effectively excluded the relevance of the statutory sale provisions. Furthermore, that the, the fact that the claimant had not properly read the contract did not impact its validity as in signing the contract, she consented uh, it to be bound by its contents. Significantly, this case emphasizes the court's respect for sanctity of contract. Attention of the other parties. So this third rule required for clauses to be considered incorporated is that reasonable steps must be taken by the party who forms the terms to bring it to the attention of the other party. And the important and the leading case in regards to this was the case of Parker and uh, Southeastern Railway Company, 1877. And this case ruled that if the document received is one that would normally contain contractual terms, uh, in and it would be common knowledge that this would be so the party receiving the document would be assumed to have notice. If a notice of the term is displayed on the contractual document, this is normally um, sufficient, as in the leading case of Thompson against London Midland and Scottish Railway Company Limited 1930. Um, and in this case, uh, it was held uh, to be irrelevant that the individual was illiterate if this fact is not known by the party supplying the document with the terms. If it was, for example, plainly obvious that the individual was blind, the term would not be incorporated. Terms can also be incorporated by referring the party to uh, a different document, which, was, which has the terms in, as in the um, Thompson and London Midland uh, Railway Company case. Um, which highlighted the ticket stated subject to conditions set out. Uh, the, the ticket stated subject to conditions set out in timetables, although the actual contractual document did not have these conditions in, the reference was enough to ob objectively incorporate them. Uh, a rule is that more exceptional or unusual a term is, the more uh, must be done to bring it to the attention of the other party. Um, and the leading case for this was the leading case of J. Sperling Limited and Bradshaw 1956. And the facts in this case that were Bradshaw sent eight barrels of orange juice to be stored at Sperling's warehouse. Sperling sent a receipt to Bradshaw on which were printed their conditions of storage. The conditions contained a clause purporting to exclude liability for any losses resulting from their negligence. 
Bradshaw fell into arrears on his storage payments and Sperling bought an action to recover uh, the monies due. The orange was spoiled and unusable and Bradshaw counterclaimed in negligence. The issue that I was identified in this case was that Bradshaw alleged Sperling were negligent and in breach of an implied term to take reasonable care of the barrels because they had left them in the open air and the orange juice had been spoiled. He further contended that he had not been given sufficient notice of the exemption clause and therefore Sperling should not be able to rely on it. Sperling denied negligence and argued that they rely on the exemption clause even if they had been negligent. The clause has been brought to the attention of Bradshaw and was clear and unambiguous in its meaning. The decision of the court was, although it had not been proven that Sperling had been negligent, even if they had been negligent, they would be able to rely on the exclusion clause to avoid liability. Sufficient notice of the clause had been given so as to make it a term of the contract. Exemption clauses will operate to protect a party only where he is carrying out his contract and not where he is de deviating from it in a fundamental respect. So now we're going to look at uh, 3.4, which is to assess the importance of construction for interpretation of the contract. How courts interpret contracts. So you have uh, the element of uh, the starting point at the top. So you look at the actual words. If the meaning is unclear, then the court may apply terms. If the meaning is what the ordinary and natural meaning is, it's set aside background and commercial context, and it refers to established judicial interpretation. If a special technical or scientific meaning, if the meaning is unclear, it resolves doubt against benefiting party, or are words of the party common category and there's two rival interpretations. If it's still unclear, then the court may apply, as we mentioned earlier, terms reasonable and equitable, obvious or necessary, or does not contradict express terms and capable of clear expression. And that's from the sources McMeal 2011. These are factors that the courts will consider. So natural meaning of the words, Use contract as a whole, factual matrix, commercial common sense, has the contract, how the contract was performed, evidence of subjective intentions, pre-contract uh, negotiations and hindsight. And these are what the courts will interpret contracts, but also each individual case is different. So when we look at contract interpretation, um, there are broad principles of contract interpretation rather than strict rules that would be applied by the court if a dispute arises as to what a court uh, contract means. The key point is to get the contract right and clear at the outset before you sign it. Having an understanding of the ba basics of contractual interpretation and why particular clause clauses are important will enable a person to ensure that contracts uh, accurately reflect their intentions. So natural meaning um, and commercial sense. At one end of the spectrum, there's a view that the court must apply the natural meaning of the words unless there's lack of clarity or an ambiguity in the language used or it would pro produce an absurd result. Then and only then can the court adopt the construction which is most consistent with commercial common sense. At the other extreme, there's the view that commercial considerations may indicate a lack of clarity or ambiguity in the first place, and that only any arguable construction must be tested against commercial uh, common sense. Recent judgment seems to indicate a trend towards a greater emphasis on the language used with higher courts generally seeking to downplay considerations of commercial sense unless there's ambiguity or lack of clarity. Where there is ambiguity, uh, there is more than one possible meaning. The court is likely to adopt uh, the interpretation that better reflects the commercial or business sense. 
as long as this does not conflict the natural meaning of the words. The factual context and relevant background may become relevant here, as this should have helped the court to work out which uh, which meaning reflects uh, the commercial ses sense best. Badly drafted contracts. A court is likely to have greater regard to commercial sense and other factors apart from the actual words used where those words are unclear or unambiguous. The best way to guard against disputes about the proper interpretation of a contract is to ensure that all clauses are carefully drafted, looking at for areas of potential um, ambiguity and paying close attention to uh, correct punctuation and grammar. Particular care should be taken with defined terms and formula, as these are common areas for problems to arise. Where additions or amendments are made, these need to be checked carefully to ensure they are clear and consistent with other provisions. Exclusion of pre-contract negotiations. So court will um, admit, will not admit evidence of the party's pre-contract negotiations for the purpose of interpreting a contract. However, such evidence may be admitted to show that a relevant background fact was known to the parties and so should be taken into account as part of the factual matrix. The exclusion exclusionary rule means that the evidence of the party's subjective aims and intentions will not be admissible for the purpose of interpreting the contract. The rule does not, however, exclude such evidence for other purposes, for example, to support a claim for rectification. For example, the written contract should be corrected because it does not reflect the terms actually agreed or estoppel by convention that the parties have negotiated an agreement based on some common assumption. Limiting the factual matrix. It is sometimes argued that admitting evidence of factual matrix is unfair to the third parties who might be affected by a contract, as it increases the risk that they may find the contract does not mean what they had thought it meant. The fact that a contract might affect a third party such as an assignee is not normally sufficient to prevent the court admitting background facts known to the original parties However, where contract is of a type that is treated as addressed to third parties, for example, articles of association, the courts may restrict the admissible background to the facts, which would have been available not only to the contracting parties, but also to the relevant third parties. The role of the factual matrix may also be more limited in contracts concluded on industry standard forms, given the particular need for commercial certainty in that context. Limits of commercial sense. While interpreting the commercial contract, courts will, will assume that the parties intended their agreement to make sense in the commercial context, which prevailed at the relevant time. However, that does not mean that commercial common sense can be necessarily be invoked to prevent the court interpreting a clause in a way that makes little commercial sense for one or other parties. In addition, commercial common sense cannot be invoked retrospectively. It is only relevant to the extent it sheds light on how matters would or could have been perceived at the time the contract was made. It can sometimes be difficult for judges to block out entirely the knowledge gained through hindsight. Contract as a whole. So in interpreting a contract in a, in a Sorry, in interpreting a term in a contract, the court will not look at the clause in the isolation and in, will interpret by reference to the contract as a whole. The positioning of a term within a clause or within the contract overall may be important because it identifies the obligations between the parties. Parties should pay close attention not just to the wording of the clause, but if the clause appears in a section of the contract relating to one issue, it may be difficult to persuade a court that um, it is meant to deal with another issue, even if the wording of the clause might be broad enough to cover that issue. If the contract is part of a series of interrelated agreements, then the court will take into account not only the contract in which a clause appears, but the overall scheme of the agreements. 
tools of construction. Where there is some doubt or ambiguity as to the meaning of a contract term, it should be construed against the party that has put forward the clause and or is seeking to rely on it. This is known as the contra profitum rule. Uh, where there's a list of examples together with general wording, the general wording may be interpreted as limiting, limited to other examples of the same type. This is the S. Judah generos rule, meaning of the same kind. Where particular objects, rights or powers are expressly, expressly mentioned, this tends to suggest that other similar objects, rights or powers are not um, meant to be included. This is known as experio unius. In general, the court will prefer an interpretation which gives effect to the contract or the particular clause rather than one that renders it ineffective or meaninglessly. Similarly, it will generally prefer an interpretation that does not allow one party to take advantage of its own wrong. In most cases, negotiations prior to the finalization of the contract will not be admissible in evidence. This includes drafts of the contract and related communications. Whilst there are a number of reasons for this, a key reason is that prior drafts and exchanges simply identified the terms that the parties were seeking to impose on the other and not what was ultimately agreed. So these are some of the references used. So we finished um, learning outcome three, which, which was to understand uh, the contractual terms and exclusion clauses in regards to contracts and the importance of these and in regards to uh, implied and express terms um, and looked at uh, what the courts expect in regards to um, the importance of the construction in contracts we also looked at how co contracts are interpreted by courts, and we also looked at uh, the incorporation of terms with reference to important cases and the rules in regards to um, incorporation of terms such as notice we looked at. We looked at contractual and attention of the other party with reference to cases uh, such as uh, Parker and Southwest Eastern Railway, Thompson and London, Sperling, the case of Boussard and Bettany and Guy, and the importance of these cases in regards to the rules. Um, these are some of the references that have been used in Learning Outcome 3, which are um, the Anson's Law of Contract, um, uh, Oxford University Press. We also looked at studies in contract law, Foundation Press, and contract law by Beale, the Law of Contract by Collins, uh, Cambridge University Press, Juris and Due Influence by Enchog, uh, Hart, The Concept of Law, um, McKendrick, Contract Law, Text, Cases and Materials, um, Oxford University Press, McMeal, The construct of the Construction of Contracts, which looked at the diagram that we looked at where the courts, how the courts will interpret um, meaning of words or terms, uh, Partington in Introduction to the Le English Legal System and Atiyah as Introduction to the Law of Contract, Oxford University Press. Okay, so you also need to um, use Moodle as a resource and, and the main tool for any sort of additional reading, any sort of cases that have been put on them uh, on Moodle for you to have a look at in regards to um, understanding contractual terms and exclusion causes and also your assignment area. Uh, you could be looking at learning outcome three in regards to uh, doing the task in regards to uh, learning outcome three. But any sort of additional resources or anything is available on Moodle for you. Thank you for attending today's session and the next session will be on learning outcome four. Thank you.